Hey, winner, welcome to Red Hot Mindset. I am so glad you're joining me today. And today is really special. Is there anything about you that you find a hindrance rather than a superpower? Does something hold you back from going after your goals? Michelle Faust has a severe hearing loss that impacted her own self-worth and created limiting beliefs that kept her stuck for years. Her story is full of vulnerability, courage, and learning how to cope in a world which values perfection by developing her alternative strengths. After 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry, she elected to leap into the entrepreneurial world and follow her heart, which ultimately led to the creation of Lemonade Legend. Her business was founded through the self-realization that she had a story herself of learning how to acquire a fearless attitude due to and despite of her hearing loss. Lemonade Legend offers both print and media exposure through her anthology series, digital magazine, publishing house, podcast, and virtual stages, and now as the producer of two TV shows featured on Zandra TV Network. Her mission is to create the largest storytelling distribution network in the world. Michelle's mission is her passion that not only provides a powerful resource for women and a few brave men struggling with their own lemonade challenges, but is also emerging into a community of like-minded people who want to share, support, and lift up their sisters and brothers. Are you ready to hear how she got unstuck? Let's step into the fire. Hey, Michelle, thank you so much for joining me on Red Hat Mindset. I'm excited to dive into your story today. Well, I'm excited to be here. And um, yeah, there's some deep diving to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you're all about sharing your story and others' stories. So this is going to be a good one, I know. Um, before we get started, can you just share a little bit about yourself, um, whatever you'd like, just so we can get to know you better before we dive in? Sure. Um, so I uh, have lived most of my life in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I've, I've, I've tiptoed out to some different types of weather, uh, such as Chicago for seven years. Um, <laughs> that's kind of why I'm back here in Arizona. Um, but I do escape over the summer months um, because we actually, um, my husband and I live in uh, the Central America area and we have a beach condo in Panama. So we get to spend the summer there and uh, hang out at the beach. So I had the, the, the best of many, many worlds here, desert and beach. Um, I uh, had 20 years in pharmaceuticals. That was my career job. Um, and then I jumped into the entrepreneurial world and I'm now publishing and writing and um, digital magazines and all kinds of fun things so I can help people share their story. I love it. I love it. And you helped me share mine. So that's how we met. We met as you were publishing your first Lemonade Stand series, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And I was a part of the second. So that was so fun. And I want to, I kind of want to go back, not to the beginning, but I want to talk a little bit about how you got to this point of being an entrepreneur, sharing other stories. And it started with your own story. And I'd love for you just to share a little bit about um, what it was like with your hearing loss and what setbacks that you felt like you had, or if you felt stuck in the beginning, um, and just share whatever you want with us about that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I can go way back into my childhood and talk about, you know, how awful it is to have any kind of disability. You know, my heart goes out to, to children have, who have to deal with anything because um, their peers are cruel. <laughs> just no other word, word for it. They really are. And, um, but we're also cruel to ourselves. You know, we, we feel that our own imperfect selves um, are just that, um, not, not perfect enough to, you know, we compare ourselves and, and, and all of that. So that's nothing new under the sun. Um, I don't know to really uh, dig into that. But going into thinking about a career was hard for me because I'm an outgoing person. I, you know, there's certain things that I, I really enjoy doing that didn't fit with 
necessarily my severe hearing loss so that everybody really understands it's a high frequency hearing loss but at sort of at a certain point i'm i'm uh, completely uh deaf the higher the, the frequency goes um so anyway so I, I just managed to learn alternative communication um i'm great at reading body language and not, not much gets past me if somebody is um expressing themselves from the from a physical standpoint um but it, it things like that help me to be a good listener uh and i have to be a good listener so um I stumbled around and ended up in pharmaceuticals, which is a um, love-hate relationship. You know, um, it, it, it's fun, or it used to be before so many regulations got put in, in place. Uh, very well-paying. It's also super competitive, and, um, and it's hard work. Um, but I did it for 20 years, and I always felt, I don't know, not the same as my coworkers. You know, they were um, typically younger than I am because it's the youth industry, um, typically prettier, and they spend their money on, you know, fancy clothes and high heels. And I was a single mom with two kids, so I was saving every dime I had and, you know, wearing the old stuff in the closet. Um, and then there was just about that, uh, you know, I can communicate, but, I, but not engage in the same way other people can't so you know in a restaurant or you're in you know a situation where you know crowded uh having fun listening to music um all those kinds of things i it just you know i'm different you know and so so i say that just just to say i felt very um separate separated you know from the norm of what pharmaceuticals was um but I did very well because I was the only rep, well, not the only rep. I was the rep who was paying attention to my doctor, listening to them because I had to. I couldn't afford to turn my head, you know, around and, you know, how people look around the room because looking at the next doctor, you know, that they want to go chase after. Um, I gave everyone my undivided attention. I watched the body language when, when I knew... I was getting pesty or they they had to go but were too polite to say um you know i'd excuse myself um because i knew i had to come back into the office again and again and again and so i developed great relationships um and that enabled me to actually be one of the top sellers so um for most of the 20 years i was in some uh, level of the top percentage of sales, won lots of trips and extra money and things like that, which was really, um, what do I want to say? What's my right word? It was very uh, helpful to, for myself to confident, but I don't even know how to tell you why. I still felt like a fraud. Hmm. I felt like I felt like I was winning you know the sales award because of a fluke or because my partner was actually doing it not me you know it's really hard to get away from that little self-doubt creature that sits on your sh your shoulder and um but anyways uh end of that story came in about 20 years when i reached the peak job um one of my dreams in in specialty pharma and uh new man manager came in and he wanted his own new um uh sales force so we were a tiny seven person division and three of us got fired at the same time and we were all top sellers um so you kind of scratch your head a little bit and go you know aren't we supposed to be rewarded when you know we're in the top top of the sales uh numbers but anyway it, it was really devastating because i was well into my 50s at the time and um uh i just couldn't stomach the idea of getting back into pharma and starting all over when i had reached that kind of pinnacle uh, uh within my company and uh so it's just hard to know what to do and i i tried several things and that, that was just like my deep dark moment uh 
were going through that period um, and feeling like I'd just uh, been thrown out with the trash. And um, so I thought, what am I, what am I gonna do? <laughs> right. Well, and are you, were, did you have any thoughts of, I got really good at pharmaceuticals. I got good with my hearing loss to listen and focus and be able to become a top seller. How am I going to do this in a different industry? What what thoughts were coming to your mind? What um because you talked a little bit about uh the limiting beliefs that you had. Were some of those coming out as you were trying to figure out your path? I think so, but I don't think I realized it until I was a mature enough and be, you know, had uh, you know, finally did jump into the entrepreneurial space. Um, because I, I really didn't know where else to turn. Um, uh, you know, did I want to go to school and learn something new or whatever? I had a dear friend who uh, was a financial advisor and he convinced me to get my license and, and join up with him. I did all that, I passed the test, and in the end, I said to him, I'm like, what am I thinking? It takes 20 or 30 years for a financial advisor to build a decent, you know, book of clients. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll be 85 for that. <laughs> now, now I'm going to have to be working really, really hard to get there. And so I, I just, you know, the reality check came, but, um, it felt so good to be wanted, and, and my friend really and truly made me feel wanted and like uh, I was the greatest thing to come, and like I would be so amazing and so successful. So that helped a lot. Uh, just his confidence in me helped a lot. But then I decided, you know, writing has always been a bit of a passion. Um, I don't know how good I am at it, but I thought, I can do content writing, you know, for uh, marketing and, and a website, things like that. And uh, so that's what I started off with. And, um, you know, the success didn't just, you know, fall in my lap. I was working hard. I was seeing some level of, of success. But what I did really see was my ability finally to say, I can do what I have to do. Okay. In other words, I never had to network in pharma because you're given a list of doctors, but that's who you call on. Um, I hate networking. <laughs> Do you hate networking? I, hate uh, I have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with it because I love meeting new people. I'm just very social, but when I think of it as networking, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of walking into the big room where you don't really know a whole lot of people, so you don't know where to go. And um, and, and again, crowd, you know, depending on the room, can be hard for me with my hearing. Right. So, so that's just one example. But I, I knew I had to network to succeed in in, in, in my entrepreneurial world, so I did. And so I began kind of patting myself on the back and uh, getting a little bit more courage um, and just doing the things you have to do as an entrepreneur. I mean, you can't make the decision to jump just halfway in. Yeah. If you're going to do it, you've got to understand what it takes to jump into that, that, that arena uh, and, you know, meeting powerful people, you know, just, I mean, I, I just felt like, I, I, who am I to be talking to these people? But I, I started building up my courage and building up my belief that I was in the right spot. I can talk to these people. I have a right to talk to these people. And so it was somewhere around there that my story bubbled up uh, because I, I kept thinking in my mind, um, uh, that I had a fearless attitude and I loved, I loved that I did because I've lived in fear most of my life. Okay. So to finally start feeling uh, a bit of a fearless attitude really w made me want to just shout it out, you know, from the rooftop. It's like, I finally made it, you know, I finally figured it out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not disabled. I'm not not normal I'm not you know I can do this mm -hmm. and and other people can too and it was just a really very strong feeling that I had that I wanted other people to understand that if 
I can do it. <laughs> well, that means anybody can, you know. Um, so that was the beginning of it. But uh, as I started talking to different publishing services, uh, uh, writing coaches, uh, just people in the arena, I realized that um, it's expensive if you want to do it right. And um, I, I like to do things right. Yeah. So uh, I, I really had to think about that. And I really had to think about, does anybody you know, want to hear just my story? Is my story big enough for a whole book? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I, uh, uh, in, in, in having just brainstorming um, with my um, publishing individuals, uh, we came up with the collaborative story idea. You know, spread the cost around a little bit, but bring in other people who have amazing stories and, um, you know, see what we come up with. So, uh, so that's how it happened. And it, uh, we called it the Lemonade Stand because it's Lemon to Lemonade Story. But there are other things behind it too that I think probably most people don't know. Um, and that is that most of the stories have an entrepreneurial um, flavor to it or lesson or something because most of the women, women ended up uh, being entrepreneurs in, in some particular way or another. And so a Lemonade Dan is kind of like a kid's first job, you know, uh, self-employment. Um, but I also saw... In a lemonade stand, I saw Lucy from the Peanuts character. Do you remember her when she would put the sign, the doctor is in? And that was a lemonade stand that she used to sit behind. And it, there's such a healing component, such, it's such a, 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 so much mental health growth that is, it happens when you write your own story. And so that, that was a strong image for me. And then also just, just the community. A lemonade stand in, in, you know, in somebody's corner in their yard. And, you know, the dad next door finishes mowing his lawn and comes up for some lemonade. And, you know, kids on their bike stop to say hi. And next thing you know, you've got a community of people. So those were all the things that I was seeing mm -hmm. when I saw the lemonade stand. I love that. That's so neat. And it's become this big stand. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later too. Um, I want to know too, as you were talking about, you became your fearless, you became fearless in entrepreneurship and writing your story and sharing your story. What was the connection? When did you make that click or how did that click happen? So I, the click happened was when I, I became determined to work in uh, an entrepreneurial position um, and accepting the fact that I simply had to go out and do the things I didn't like. So um, it was no longer a, an excuse. This is hard for me, so therefore I don't wanna do it. Um, I've been in sales calls before that uh, were heavily geared towards cold calling. Mm -hmm. I would tell myself, I don't like cold calling, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Um, but it's a different thing when you're building your own business and um, you are accountable really only to yourself and those excuses just stop working. And so when you're, when you're forced to do the things that you, you hate, you know, the most, it's empowering, you know, because then you say, oh, I did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so that was the fearlessness because, you know, I, I used to not do things because I was fearful. And then I started doing things because I had to be fearless. Um, so in the beginning, I wanted to write a book that, I don't know, working title was something like, um, I can't remember what it was, something to, you know, Fear, fearless through faith, because I had a lot of faith, not only in God, but in myself. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my first working title. And then I realized there is no such thing as fearless. That is just, that, that is a non-existent word. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we all have some level of fear sometimes, somewhere. It's the attitude we take, you know, against that fear. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, I, I had to kind of change my thinking around that, that, you know, fear is an ever-present um, part of our environment and emotion. Yeah. But you can't go through it. Yeah, that's true. And and those who are successful are the ones who ha- feel the fear and they still do it. They still do what they need to do. And it sounds like that's what you did. And that's kind of how you found your quote unquote fearless. Not that you mm-hmm. weren't scared, but you were willing to do what you needed to do. Exactly. And it didn't, I mean, I, I, I would come home from networking meeting and just say, just hate that so much, you know, but then I go, but I did it. You know, and look, I've got this, I've got this car, a business card, and they said, call me. So, you know, I would do little things like that and attack those fearful things a little bit at a time. And, um, and you know, it was just like learning how to adapt in the uh, physician pharmaceutical world. I, I learned to adapt uh, in the, um, in my new world. And because I did have partners when I was in pharma, so I kind of could say, well, maybe that's why we're successful is more because of the partner or something. Um, but when you're on your own, you, you, you either make it or, or break it all on your own. So I had no one to blame and no, no, or, and no one else to credit when I went right. Yeah. Me. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think it's interesting because a lot of women do I, a lot of women do this. They will discredit themselves and go, well, maybe it was something else or someone else helped or whatever it was. What, do you have any idea why? Why do you think that is? Why is it that we don't, we don't stand up and be proud of what we do or say, yes, I did that. I accomplished this. Hey, you, know, you can't pin this on 100% of all families and people, but uh, you know, we're we're still in a world of um, male dominance um, in terms of a lot of how we're raised as children. And I think the boys are more encouraged to get into sports um, or praise for, you know, the grades get into Harvard or whatever. I, you know, we've come a long way, but I still believe that there is a certain amount of that that is still um, prevalent in raising girls versus boys. And so I think we just, uh, we just grow up with that feeling of just the slightest bit of inadequacy mm-hmm. or limiting beliefs. Um, you know, but there's some many other factors and 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 I don't know why for sure but I will say I think it's also because women naturally are nurturing we don't nurture ourselves (laughs) that's true natural naturally nurturing to others Mm -hmm. and so sometimes we forget who we are and what we're capable of because we're we're spending it all on making sure our spouses, our kids, um, our best friends, our parents, you know, are all well cared for. And um, so sometimes we don't measure up because elderly parents sometimes just get sicker and sicker, you know, and you can't do anything about it. Or sometimes marriages start falling apart. And, you know, we just naturally blame ourselves for that, even though it's a two-way street. Um, you know, if your kid turns out to be a bully as a parent, as a mother, you naturally start blaming yourself because that just as women who we, who we are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really true. And it is, there is a little stigma or we are nurturing and we just, we care so much about other people and making sure that everyone else is being applauded or, you know, we're proud of this, your accomplishment here and your accomplishment here. And then we forget about, Hey, we had a piece of that, or we did something. And I, that's, and I sharing our stories, like what you do probably helps us to go, wow, look at what, 
I was able to do, or look at, you know, just being able to piece together that, yeah, I was, I'm pretty, not that I'm like super special, but like, I have a gift that I was able to give to the world. I had a message I was able to share and God could use me through that. And just looking at that and just going, yep, yep. That's what, that's what I need to do. If you are interested in hearing these stories I'm sharing more in depth, you need to pick up a copy of the Lemonade Stand 2 Anthology. This series is a powerful testimony of others willing to step up and share their stories for emotional growth and inspiration. I had the privilege to be a part of Book 2, which is a collective of narratives of true everyday heroes who show you how to stand in your power, find the courage to seek truth, and reveal your authentic self. I wrote the running for my life chapter because we need to have more open conversations about mental health. Too many young souls are falling culprits to depression or suicide in this noisy world. I decided it was time to open up and share my story. I dealt with severe depression and anxiety in early adulthood and through personal development, mentorship, and my deep faith, I was able to take back my life and come off all medications. It's hard to be vulnerable in this area that is usually filled with much shame and guilt, and I didn't want to end up back in that place by drying out all the emotions I knew would come out as I wrote, but I knew it was time. It was time to share the story I've hidden for years in an effort to help and support anyone else who may be dealing with negative thoughts or feelings that are spiraling them down into a dark place. There is hope and light in the midst of darkness. Are you in the midst of a struggle of your own? Pick up a copy of this book to find encouragement, inspiration, and motivation to move forward into your breakthrough. Our stories are meant to be shared. Head to www.redhotmindset.com to snag your signed copy of The Lemonade Stand 2. So in all of this, what do you think was your biggest lesson that you have learned, especially um, going from the hearing loss could have been an excuse. It could have kept you down and you did have to struggle through it, but you were able to overcome it and say, I'm going to take my life and I'm going to do something with it. So what were the, what was the biggest lesson? Do you think? I think that probably comes in an, in an end, having the faith of knowing that there, there is a purpose for everything. And when I, began my my process of kind of self-examination I, I did realize yeah there's a lot of things about my childhood that really sucked <laughs> no better word for it than that right. but, <laughs> um there were a lot of things in my adult life that you know were very difficult there wasn't a day in my life that I haven't really wished I I could hear and participate in a different way and then I started looking at it differently and saying, okay, so let's, let's say God has a purpose for me to have a hearing loss. And what does that mean? Um, and I think it meant a lot of things. It meant having to learn how to communicate a little bit differently. And, and, um, and so I am, I'm actually a good communicator. I'm a great communicator. Mm-hmm. If it's one-on-one, you know, if I'm at a party, I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to hear half of what you say but that's not when really solid you know deep conversation goes on so (laughs) um so I saw that and I saw that I was able to do very very well in in pharma and and earn money and and like I said was a single mom I was not getting any support um so that became something where I said well I might have been in pharma anyways even with great hearing but Would I have been in the same kind of rep? Would I have been as successful if I wasn't having to be so focused? Um, I I always had to be better than anybody else. So I worked weekends, I worked nights, you know, crunching my numbers and doing all that because it was like I had to be better to come even close to being as good as anybody else. Um, So I guess to answer your question, it was realizing that there people have have purpose. Everybody has purpose. And if if I'm not allowing myself to have purpose, then I'm 
subconsciously saying other people who are imperfect perhaps don't have a purpose in life. Hmm. So I, I, I had to give myself permission to say, this is my purpose in life. You know, it's to maybe it's to struggle, but I believe that when God has a great purpose for us, we have to struggle to become prepared for future greatness. And um, I learned that when I found myself sitting in jail for five days, which is another story. <laughs> <laughs> that you have to read Lemonade Stand 2 to hear. <laughs> oh, I did write about it, and it was a hard one. But, you know, you... you, you um, but there is a purpose because I learned so much sitting in jail for five days without anyone to talk to in my silence, you know, managed to find a couple of Christian books. And I was like, yeah, I managed to meditate and I realized, wow, I never thought of such and such that way. I think for most of us, our best counselors are inside our head if we just allow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And um, letting the Holy Spirit guide us and allow him to work through us because that is where we are guided, you know? And I love, I <laughs> bring up the jail. That's so funny because when I found out that you went to jail, I just had a laugh. I'm like, what, what did she do? And oh we're, no, we're not going to answer that on here because you have to read the book to find out. But it is so funny. Just this, the experiences that you can have and the lessons you can learn through them, just random ones, like going to jail. <laughs> It is truly one other story, and you do have to read it because it would take me way too long to, to tell it because there's so many complexities around it. But, um, yeah, that's everybody's response. What? You're this 60-year-old, like, squeaky clean record grandmother. What the heck? Are you, you know, so, but it's an interesting story. It's worth getting the book all by itself. <laughs> I, I agree. I think so. It was just so fun to read it. Um, so now as we, as we're wrapping up, I would love to, if you could just share one piece of advice for listeners about overcoming adversity, if they have feel like they're stuck in some way, or there's something about them um, that they feel like is holding them back, or it's an excuse that they have to not move forward. What would your advice be? So my advice would be um, just move forward. I mean, that, that may sound simple, but um, it's not. It's way easier to stay stuck than it is to move forward. And I think that you have to look at why am I stuck? And for a lot of people, not everybody, but for a lot of people, it may have to do with self-forgiveness. Um, it may have to do with forgiving somebody else. They, they get themselves stuck because they can't get past something maybe that was done to them. Um, but whatever, you're stuck for a reason. And you have to figure out what that reason is and then get over it. Yeah. <laughs> move forward. <laughs> get over it. Get over that hump and move forward. That's perfect. That's a great way to end. Um, now, what's the best way for listeners to connect with you? I'm easy to find. My, my website is lemonadelegend.com and uh, just within the website, um, there's ways to fill out a form to share your story and the email. Um, this, that honestly is, is the, the best way. Just go to the website. Um, but my email is uh, readily available to anyone, michelle at lemonadelegend.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you'll find me. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And if you are interested in learning more about why sharing your story is so important and some tips on how to do that, we, Michelle's coming back on on Thursday. We're going to talk through this and she's going to give us some tips on how do we open up and start sharing that story? Because even if you don't think so, you have a story inside of you. And when you share it, you're actually blessing somebody else, whether it's one person or a million you are making an impact and you are supposed to make an impact. So that's what you're gonna be hearing from us for on Thursday. 
But in all things, I pray you just run your race. I believe in you.